Hey everyone, I'm still going to be branching off of our last video where we talked about biophysical development. We are still going to be under the umbrella topic of developmental theories, which help describe development throughout the lifespan. So today we are going to be covering psychoanalytical and psychosocial theories. And these describe human development for them from the perspective of personality, thinking, and development primarily in the unconscious mind. And they're basically influenced by emotion. Um, you just have cultural uh, influence here, family influence. And most of these, as they progress through the theories, if there's any interruption in one of the stages, the further stages are affected and cannot be reached properly. Our first theorist that we're going to be covering, and remember theorists are in pink, is going to be the creepy old guy, Sigmund Freud, and his psychosexual development theory. And there are five stages, and I'll tell you at the end a clever way to remember um, what order these stages go in. So we start with the oral stage, and this begins in infancy from the minute you're born until you're about 18 months old. And the oral stage involves oral satisfaction. So they understand that when something goes in their mouth, they're getting nourishment or, you know, some sort of oral satisfaction. Um, any disruption of physical or emotional availability of the, pa of the parent, um, it can impair the development of the child. This is where you develop those oral fixations. Uh, makes you more likely to be a smoker or overeat, things like that. So that's something to look at. Then we have the anal stage, which is from typically 18 months to three years old, and this is when we begin our potty training. So at this stage, they delay gratification, or in this case, defecation, uh, the relief that they get from that, to satisfy their parents and social acceptance, basically. Um, then you have the phallic stage, which is from three to six years old, when children become aware of their genitals, males of their penis and females of their lack of a penis. Um, typically in this stage, um, the child starts to identify more with the parent of the same sex. And from age 6 to 12, we have our latency period. And basically, this is all about suppressed urges. Um, and just trying to fit in. And then we have the genital stage, which is from puberty to adulthood. And this is when those sexual urges come about. Um, you start entering into sexual relationships. And if any of the stages before this were interrupted, they could have impaired development, which generally leads to unhealthy relationships and unhealthy ideas about sex. Um, my acronym for this is Old Aunt Peggy Likes Grapes. So we have oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. So this next one is considerably easier. This one is concerning temperaments. We have <clears throat> Stella Chess and Alexander Thomas. They did a 20 year study and they came up with three basic temperaments to describe a child. So you have your easy child who is easygoing, even-tempered, pre very predictable, um, adapts easily to new situations, new people, and generally have very positive mood expressions. Then you have your difficult child who is typically very active and irritable, um, very irregular with their routines. They typically withdraw from others. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They prefer a structured environment, and they adapt very slowly to new situations. Uh, their mood expressions are typically very intense and very negative. Then you have the slow to warm up child, and they typically react negatively with mild intensity to new stimuli. Um, they adapt slowly with repeated contact, but um, they do resist if you pressure them. They don't like being pressured into things. Um, and they typically don't like change in their routine. This next theorist is also pretty prominent. I have seen his name mentioned a lot. Uh, this is Jean Piaget, his theory of cog cognitive development. Um, 
there are four stages. There is the sensory motor phase. Uh, this is from ages zero to two. Uh, they learn about the self and their environment through touch and through reflex. So um, they learn about texture by putting their blankie in their mouth or um, touching things, feeling things. Um, then we have the pre-operational phase, which is from two to seven. Um, here we see egocentrism, which is, um, they believe that everyone views the world the same way that they do, that life is the same for everyone as it is for them. Then again, we see animism, which is giving personality to their dolls and their teddy bears. Um, there's a lot of magical thinking, and yes, that is the actual term that will be used. Um, <clears throat> and again, we see that play therapy is very useful for this age group of patients while we're caring for them. Uh, from ages 7 to 11, we have concrete operations. This is when children start to develop concrete uh, mental operations. Uh, you know, they're learning math and spelling and some critical thinking. Um, they learn about reversibility. Uh, at this age, they should be able to describe a process forward and then also know how to reverse the process. Uh, they're able to classify things by height, weight, length, color, so things like that. Um, and then also conservation. And this is um, that the amount of something stays the same uh, no matter how much you change the physical form. It's like if you have two different shaped glasses, one has water, and if you pour it into the other one, it might look different, but it's still the same amount of water. Um, then from 11 years old to adulthood, we have formal operations. And during this period, we see a lot of risk taking, especially in adolescence. And this is where reasoning comes in um, and a lot more critical thinking. And that was when uh, Jean Piaget felt that cognitive development ended. Um, the acronym that I have for this one is Small Pigs Can Fly, so sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operations, and formal operations. The next one we have is Lawrence Kohlberg's Theory of Moral Development, and this one <clears throat> gets a little messy. There are six stages of development here, but they're within three levels. So I'm going to go ahead and include a picture here of my note card in case you wanted to copy it. And it might just give you a better visualization of what I'm talking about when I go through the steps. So now that you've seen the note card <clears throat> and all the stages, I'm going to kind of walk you through it and explain everything just a little bit more so it makes some more sense. So level one, we have pre-conventional reasoning. And this is pre-morals, before you really understand what's right from wrong. Most of this is guided by punishment versus reward. Um, and a lot of children in this stage view illness as a punishment, so it's important for nurses to emphasize that it's not their fault, that they're not being punished. Um, within level one, we have stage one, which is punishment versus obedience orientation. And this is basically unquestioning obedience if, uh, you know, if I do this, this is wrong because I'm being punished. Stage two, we have instrumental relativist orientation. And this is more about avoiding punishment. Not necessarily that they view they're being punished because it's wrong, they just want to avoid being punished altogether. For instance, a child comes home before the street lights come on because they don't want to be stuck in their room all night, not because it's wrong. Then we have level two. And level two is conventional relationship, or excuse me, conventional reasoning. And this is focused more on relationships. How is what I'm going to do affect my relationship with my parents or my teacher? Uh, within level two, we have stage three. 
This is good boy, nice girl orientation. This is all about wanting approval. Um, like doing the dishes before mom gets home so she'll be happy and maybe make some dessert or something. Just it's wanting the approval of, you know, teachers and authority figures. Um, also within stage or level two, we have stage four which is society maintaining orientation. And this is where we really begin to get an understanding of right versus wrong. Um, then we have level three, which is post-conventional reasoning. And this is where personal morals come into play. We start to understand that not everything is just black and white. Um, stage five, which is within level three, is social contract orientation. And this is about basic human rights and um, basically following a law without questioning it. Uh, you don't speed, you don't drive without your seatbelt because that's the law. And then stage six, we have universal ethical principle orientation. <clears throat> this is more about equal rights and justice. Um, a good example is Martin Luther King, although it was the law that <clears throat> the African Americans were to ride in the back of the bus, that wasn't right. So he refused to follow that law, and <clears throat> um, different things like that, like women's rights to vote, and um, it's it's more about equality and that kind of gray area in between what's right versus wrong. Touching just a little bit more on moral development. Um, Everyone in your healthcare team is probably going to have a different set of morals. So it's very important that you stick to yours. Um, for instance, if you have a homeless patient, um, a lot of them get treated very differently based on their appearance, um, you know, judgment from case managers and frustration about length of stay and waste of resources. Um, but you as a nurse know that they obviously deserve just as much care as someone with a million dollars in the best health, you know, insurance in the world. So it's it's vital that you stick to your morals and that you be that patient advocate that they need. All right, guys, that's going to do it for developmental theories. I will move on to a different set of theories here. Um, if you have any in particular that you would like me to do, let me know, and I will keep them coming.